All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We'll get started in a, about one minute. We have some participants still rolling in. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And started shortly. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. All right, we have our participant count is clicking up. So we will be started here in about 30 seconds. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Challenge Success Fishbowl, focusing on the theme of positive relationships. And our title today is Where Are We, where are we Now and Where Are We Going? Um, and we're really focusing on our school community. So a fishbowl is an opportunity for us to explore uh, complex topics and listen to multiple stakeholders to understand their various perspectives on a variety of different things. And really, again, today, our focus is on, is on uh, relationships and primarily relationships between adults and students, uh, relationships within our community. So I look forward to a, a conversation with an incredible panelist of individuals. My name is Michael Keller and I'm the Director of Social Emotional Support. I'm lucky enough to work in, uh, we're going to be unified in my fourth year and we work with a team of two student support specialists, seven school counselors, and five school psychologists to provide school-based mental health services. Um, I'm fortunate to work with an incredible team of teachers and administrators and staff to support the wellness and social emotional well being of all students. I'd like to um, introduce our panelists today and thank you so much for our, our panelist team representing a variety of different stakeholders. First and foremost, I want to introduce Soren Tipo, who really uh, was the brainchild behind this event, brain adult behind this event, and so I appreciate him. He's a graduating senior from Laguna Beach High School. Next up, I'd like to introduce Cleo Washer. And Cleo is a 10th grader at Laguna Beach High School and a student leader. And we really appreciate having a student athlete. We really appreciate having her voice today. And we have a, a, our eighth grade representative from Thurston Middle School, Tess Smilowitz, who is a student leader at Thurston. And really gonna be giving us this, uh, great perspectives around the middle school experience. And I'd also like to introduce uh, this is Shaheen Sheikh Sadal, a parent of two elementary age students and a PTA leader at Top of the World Elementary School. Thank you so much for being here today, Shaheen. I'd like to introduce two of our teacher, teachers who are kind enough to join us this morning. First and foremost, from Thurston Middle School, Leah Prettyman, who is an English teacher, uh, uh, leader of students in the Leadership Club, and provides lots of great instruction for our students. And uh, needing no introduction, but I will introduce her. This is Don Honeycutt, wonderful English language arts teacher from Laguna Beach High School and a Challenge Success team member. All these individuals represent uh, members uh, and leadership in the area of Challenge Success. And so I appreciate their participation. And lastly, I'd like to introduce our superintendent, our leader, Dr. Jason Valoria. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Valoria, and appreciate you giving us not only the, the leadership voice, but also voice as a parent of students in the Gunna Beach Unified School District. And lastly, we have Shelly Spassard who'll be joining us too and, and helping to facilitate the Q&A session at the end. So thank you all for being here. I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Soren Tipo, our Challenge Success Club Leader to share about the district's work with Stanford University's Challenge Success Program. Thank you, Dr. Geller. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. So let's give a little context to this conversation. Uh, Laguna Beach High School has partnered with Stanford University's John Success program since 2018, and Thurston Middle School recently joined in 2020. And John, John Success's goal, as the name suggests, is to partner with schools, families, and communities to embrace a broader definition of success and implement research-based strategies uh, to promote student well-being, equity, and engagement with learning. 
we have embedded this child success philosophy into our own philosophies through engagement, redefined definitions of success, and focusing on student balance and well-being. We use child success resources to understand and identify root causes of these factors and generally support our students by implementing these research-based strategies and solutions. For us, some of these solutions uh, have been a later schedule start, bringing on speakers from child success, creating a mentorship initiative, and increasing projects in the classroom and project-based assessment in class as well. And now I'll pass it back to Dr. Keller. Thank you, Swarm. Appreciate that overview. And so I'd like to open up our conversation today. And just for the lay of the land, we'll be having our panelist discussion for about an hour, and then we'll be having a brief Q&A session at the end. So please don't hesitate to ask the panelists questions and as they come up. So I'll open up the conversation today. Let's start with a reflection over the past year and a half of the pandemic and the lessons that you've learned. So COVID was the ultimate stress test of our time, testing us as individuals and as a system. How have you as an individual and a representative of a system learned from the pandemic stress test? What will you take forward and what will you not continue? And I'd like to perhaps hear some initial thoughts from everybody on this one. So I'll start over with Tess Smilowitz. So as an individual, I have, um, I definitely learned about like a, re, a new definition of stress and um, about self-success. So for me, it's about like, for me, uh, for me, it's about trying my hardest. And this year, especially, I've just learned that like life throws curveballs and to adapt and adjust to that sort of thing. So when um, I come up to a problem now, I have sort of a new mindset, a growth mindset, where instead of just being stubborn and thinking that I can't do something, I have very much like an open mindset and I'm ready to take on things. Because uh, as we've learned this past year, like perseverance and resilience is really important when passing through like problems and just life. Excellent, thank you. What are your thoughts, Cleo? I mean, as a student, I have a similar answer to test. I feel, or to test, sorry. I believe that I learned that everything can change in just a matter of moments with COVID. Like we didn't expect being out a whole year, but we adapted. And honestly, I think this year with the smaller classes, it made my bonds with my teachers and honestly, some of my classmates stronger. And I think we should carry that on throughout the next year. Okay, thank you. How about you, Soren? I think for me, just the pandemic really slowed me down, um, not in terms of like the work done, but just you know, in terms of life, there wasn't a lot of stuff got stopped. And I think I want to try to keep some of that balance going forward in the sense of, you know, balancing all the craziness of our lives and the technology in it um, with also just being present uh, in ourselves and taking the time during, during the day just to you know, be, be mindful and, and take a breath. Awesome, thank you. How about you, Leah? I would say just how incredibly resilient the whole Laguna Beach community can be with the parents taking on new roles uh, and with the, the students having to do things that college students are learning to do um, and the staff completely revamping everything and adapting um, and just how important those connections are. I, I, think, I think for me personally, I realized how connected I am with my coworkers. I felt a different level of connection with my students though it was better in many ways because I felt like I was looking right at their face all the time. So it was interesting to see um, how close I think our community really is and, and how important we value the education. And I think my biggest takeaway is how important that, that human connection is between the whole Laguna Beach community from the parents to the staff to the students. And, and, and that's a really important part for, for supporting student growth. Excellent, thank you. How about, how about initial thoughts from you, Don? Yeah, I learned uh, that less is more um, and the pandemic sort of forced that. Spring of 2020 was uh, difficult and we triaged it as best we could. We have all the support in the world in this district and we had 
you know, all the resources. And so we were very fortunate, but it was a, it was difficult. And so we took the lessons we learned from spring of 2020 into fall of 2021 with smaller classes, less classes for students. We just really wanted to make sure that academically they were okay and socially, emotionally, they were okay. Um, and so for me, less was more, um, smaller classes, more connection with students because we know students learn best when they feel connected to their teacher. It's science. Um, and um, they were more engaged because they felt heard and they felt seen. Um, and so even though we were on Zoom and we were isolated for so long, um, there was that connection there with the individual breakout rooms and the private chats. I mean, those things I wish I could carry through into the classroom because those things were invaluable. Um, we also adapted our assessments um, and the way that we taught. We had to find new ways um, to teach and we needed to really adapt quickly. And so uh, I grew immensely as a teacher and I agree with the students that, uh, and Leah, what she said, the students were incredibly resilient throughout the whole thing. Um, and I think they are capable of way more than we think they are, and they proved that. So um, that was really exciting to see. They are very, very self-sufficient and resilient and adaptable and positive and grateful. They were so grateful through all of it. It was amazing. Oh, thank you. And Shaheen, how about the parent perspective? Yeah, I think uh, I think I echo Soren's uh, Soren's thought here about just slowing down, simplifying. Um, you know, I think when you're a parent of young children, <laughs> things can get pretty crazy pretty fast, and the pandemic really forced that. I think that the other piece of it I want to add is a PTA lens, empathy, empathy, empathy. I think that was such a big thing for us from a PTA perspective was to really understand that our community members were going through so much, fear being one of them. Um, and I think we did it, we tried our best to make that the focus of all of our efforts and I, in, in, in a hope to keep the community connected even while we were isolated. And I think that would be something I'd want to keep, keep going with, you know. That's excellent. Thank you. And, and Dr. Valoria, any thoughts from you? You know, I think people, um, all, all the, the folks on this call made it very clear, um, as an organization, you know, being able to, um, pivot, um, we, you know, never have has education had to, in the modern age, uh, deal with a situation like this. And uh, I think we can all agree, we're hopeful that uh, we don't ever have to deal with this again. Um, but in, in the process, I think we learned a lot around, um, you know, what uh, what are the areas of focus and trying to keep students at the center of everything was was really paramount. And um, so I, I appreciate the the focus of, uh, of our staff to, you know, keep those relationships strong with students, even if we're in a virtual environment, um, you know, it was even more important at that point because um, so easy to get lost uh, in a virtual environment we've recognized. And so, uh, again, I just appreciate everyone's flexibility and adaptability. I know that uh, it was a pandemic and uh, in, in, in this instance, there's no necessarily right answers uh, to a lot of these challenges we faced. But um, I think, you know, as we come out this other side, you know, we're, uh, we've learned some things that we'd like to, to continue and some things that we probably don't want to do. And uh, um, so I just appreciate everyone's continuing learning because that's really what we did during this process. So. Oh, thank you so much. Those are, those are great, like big picture thoughts from everybody. I do want to drill down a little bit more into the school setting and kind of think back even before um, we went under the distance learning conditions in March of last year. Um, so what are some of the things that in the school setting specifically that, um, that we should simply let go of or keep doing or create if it doesn't already exist? And Leah, I'll start to kick this off for you. Um, well, so I've always been kind of a big believer that students do better when they're connected with other kids on campus. And at the middle school level, sometimes that's hard. There's a lot of changes that go on. They might not have known people I really think that having group events, student events and activities that they can participate in, um, if you can monthly on campus so that students have the opportunity to connect with each other. Because um, it's hard sometimes in the classroom, you can do that to some extent, but there's so much content that we have to teach. Um, so having activities at lunch so they can meet new people that they might not see otherwise in their classes or aren't part of their social group or just give them an opportunity to participate in something bigger and feel like a bigger part of the community, I think is really important. So continuing student like group activities would be would be very important to me at the middle school level. Excellent. Thank you. How, how about you, Tess? What are your thoughts? 
Yeah, so definitely like Ms. Padin was saying, I think that relationships and friendships are a huge part of making the school community. So what I really enjoyed this year, I know it's a difficult like thing to juggle is the small class size because I really enjoyed being able to have like a more direct um, relationship with my teachers. And because of the amount of time and that we were in class and the uh, amount of people, if I didn't understand something, my teachers were really able to focus on me and help me with the problem. And even just with like my classmates, I was able to build like such a stronger connection with them than I have in the past years, because since it's like a smaller group, it's sort of like a sense of community within my class. So I really enjoyed that this year. And I think if we can incorporate that into the next years, that would be really nice. And also just sort of like the assessments this year, like Ms. Honeycutt was saying, I think they definitely changed. And for example, just in a few of my classes this year, they've done assessments differently where it's like a smaller test that every week or something like that, where I felt like I was really being tested like on my knowledge instead of just cramming everything into my head the night before. So those are just some of the things that I really enjoyed this year. All right, great. Thanks. Lots for us to think about. Thank you. How about you, Cleo? I mean, Tess kind of took the words out of my mouth, but the smaller classes definitely helped this year create more of a bond with my teachers and especially with my classmates being with them for especially in the trimester system. I felt this year being in class with my two teachers, I feel very close with them and comfortable that I can reach out to them if I need them and with my students in my class. Um, I became I like grew friendships with kids that I hadn't talked to in a while. And I thought that was great. Oh, excellent. Thank you. And Soren, last last person on this one. What, what are your thoughts? I think for me, something to let go of would be the rigidity and kind of the insanely packed schedule we've had in the past. I, I personally enjoyed having a few fewerish classes um, that allowed me to have more flexibility in terms of doing extracurriculars um, and just kind of pursue my passions. Also, and this is kind of an online only thing, I think, um, I was able to, you know, Pursue, I was able to make the education more personal, personalized to myself um, on certain topics that were interesting to me. I was able to kind of dig, dive deeper and other topics just kind of take, take what was there. Uh, and I, I enjoyed that, um, that, that offer of flexibility and opportunity to, to do further research. Excellent. Thank you. Great perspective from a graduating senior. Thanks. And then uh, Dr. Valoria, how about you? Thinking of over the past 15 months, uh, uh, just really get into more specifics. What, what are some things that you might be thinking about in terms of things you'd want to retain or maybe change in the future? Well, I think, you know, to the point that uh, a lot of folks have made, I mean, our, our, we've always been focused on relationships and I think that, that has to continue, um, especially as we move into this fall. Uh, that uh, we recognize our students um, are under a significant amount of stress and the pandemic just, um, you know, added to that. So, you know, uh, we are going to need to find ways to engage our students, recognize uh, if they're, you know, overwhelmed or under a significant amount of stress and make sure that we're providing those services. So I think, you know, we, again, learning through this process, it's, it can be a challenge to try to recognize, you know, students under stress in, a, in an online environment. Uh, but now that our students are back, uh, you know, in, in person, for the most part, we do still have some students, obviously, distance learning. But um, I recognize that uh, our, our students, um, you know, are going to continue to need that support. And that needs to continue as far it, for perpetuity, in my opinion. So I appreciate, you know, the, the team, the, the counseling team that we have uh, in our school district and looking to add to that team so we can, um, you know, uh, continue that outreach and be proactive. Um, you know, oftentimes in school districts, uh, if we don't have the staff to do things, we become more reactive. Um, but now we're, we're focusing more on being proactive and providing students that space and that time to, to engage for their mental health. Um, it, we all recognize that students cannot achieve um, unless they're in a good space mentally. So that is, uh, is paramount uh, to us as an, as an organization. And, you know, I think the, the other piece that we recognize too is uh, there are ways that we can shift our curriculum and instruction, uh, you know, where I, I heard teachers say, you know, that this forced them to really look at what, what is important and what they're teaching and how they're doing it and in looking at other ways uh, than the traditional format that they might have been used to. So, you know, well, we want to continue that innovation and, um, and that, that's an important piece of, of teaching is always looking at what we're doing and reflecting on practice and and our staff is fantastic at doing that, and they were really forced to do that this year. Um, so it put them put them in that position where you know oftentimes you're 
you're into that uncomfortable role of, okay, now I really, really have to dig in here and really uh, identify what we need to do and to continue uh, to improve as a district and as a classroom and as a teacher. Um, so again, I think those are all things that we'll continue to focus on as we move forward, uh, but especially, you know, that the challenge success side of uh, focusing on students' well-being. Um, and we want really well-rounded students walking out the doors here in Laguna Beach Unified School District. And, uh, and that is a team effort uh, that we all need to continue to work through. Excellent. Thank you so much for those thoughts. So the pandemic really has reminded us how important connections and relationships are uh, to health and wellness for students and staff and families in the community. So looking ahead to next school year, what are some ways that we can think about um, supporting relationships and connections? And really on the flip side of that, what are some ways that we can think about um, supporting students who have become disengaged from school and school activities? And I'll start with Cleo on this one. Okay, so this year with either if it's the current ninth graders or the incoming ninth graders, there's definitely been a lack of they haven't been on campus for very long and they haven't gotten used to it or the incoming ninth graders haven't even maybe seen the campus so i feel like we need to up and increase activities and social opportunities so they can bond and understand the campus but not only that i also think that there is a large group of kids who haven't even gotten used to laguna kids that have moved this year from different schools who don't know anyone, don't know any teachers, don't know the campus, have been on Zoom. So I think coming back into this year, we need to have more um, like activities where they can get used to the campus, get used to the um, like environment and the people. Oh, those are great thoughts, thank you. Um, uh, Leah, what are your thoughts on this one? So one of them is we're, if we look at it the right way, we're definitely coming into this with everyone having a common history because we've all kind of lived through this and some were definitely affected more than others, but it is kind of put us in the same community sense that could allow us to kind of bond and make up Laguna Beach even stronger. And um, I, I really feel like the teachers, you know, we're, we're in this because we love to help people and help children specifically become better not just in their academic setting, but but well-rounded, um, like Dr. Blory was talking about, whole whole students. And so I feel like this, the teachers having the opportunity to reach out independently to the students, kind of understanding it made everybody kind of more empathetic with each other and keeping up that. Um, ex seems like they're just like not connected as much as they were, um, reaching out explicitly to them. I think we've always kind of done that, but I really think this has put a highlight on how important school is, again, for, for the whole child. So thank you. How about you, Sarn? Yeah, just echoing what Mrs. Priman and Cleo said, I think you know, finding ways to create relationships, whether that's between students and students, students and teachers, or even teachers and teachers. I've heard from some teachers that, you know, this year, especially for new teachers, it kind of forced them to have like mentorships with other teachers and, you know, work closer together than they have in the past. I think that's an awesome thing for our district as a whole to do, where we can really promote relationships because you know the science says that we learn better, we teach better when we feel connected to what we're doing. And I think that if we can innovate and find ways to increase that um, in normal conditions, obviously the pandemic wasn't the best impetus for that, but you know, in normal conditions, I think finding ways to increase that is a really, really great step forward. Okay, great, excellent thoughts. Shaheen, what's the parent perspective on this one? So I'm going to give you the perspective of a parent with two kids who done VA. Um, my fifth grader ended up going back in March, but my second grader stayed. Um, I, I will start by saying academically, I think it was a rigorous program and I don't think my kids skipped a beat that way. Um, the teachers were awesome um, and did a great job of, of keeping them kind of at pace. I think the thing that we didn't do great is keeping our kids rooted to their homeschools and their and their communities at their home schools and um, you know, extreme circumstances, just going forward, what can we learn? So um, the one thing I would say is, um, there's a few things I expect that those kids that from the littles perspective, right? So you might have some separation anxiety because they've been home, right, for over a year. Um, and so when they get back to school, how's that transition gonna be? And so being mindful of that and sort of supporting those kids that way. Um, the other thing that I've noticed, especially with my younger one, is sort of um, when I see him having playdates with children that have been on campus versus what he is, 
you can see that he's still kind of skewing a little more innocent. Like developmentally, he's kind of sort of stayed more as a first grader uh, and, and in part because he hasn't really had a lot of peer-to-peer -peer connections, you know, sort of daily. So that's an interesting thing to, to kind of grapple with as we head back onto campus. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that I think about is, is how do we to root those kids that have been off campus, especially the younger ones and kind of get them. I mean, for my, my little one, he's been more at home now with elementary school than he's actually been on campus in elementary school. So how do we balance all of those things and bring them back? Yeah, those are, those are excellent thoughts. Thank you. Um, uh, Mrs. Honeycutt, any, any thoughts on these? Yeah, I think um, going off of what Shaheen said, teachers need to really uh, be cognizant of where the students are coming from. And I think we have had lots of conversations here at the high school about uh, meeting kids where they are uh, when they step into our classrooms um, in the fall. And kid over content, uh, Kelly Gallagher, who's one of my favorite teachers ever and has written many books, he always says that, and it should always be the case, kids over content. Um, you teach kids first and then your content is second. And so we really have to, especially in 21, 22, we have to um, be cognizant of where the students are coming from, where they've been through, like what they've been through. Like Leah was saying, we have this shared history. Some students have been online the whole time. Um, some students have struggled. Um, some students have been working a ton, like everyone's coming from a different place. And so we really need to, to give the beginning of the year a little more time to, to recalibrate and, and find that connection. We can do that through smaller classes, like the students were saying. Um, I just know for myself in the trimester system uh, with you know, 20 students in a class, I knew my students in 24 hours. Um, I knew their names. And that was huge to come back the next day and be able to just talk with students like we had been together for a month. Um, and that's going to be huge in the fall. I think more than ever, the students are going to need that connectivity, that small classroom experience. And um, we need to like glide into this next phase. Um, I know everyone wants to get back to normal, but normal will never happen again. We are in this new world and we need to embrace it and learn from what we, we experienced in the pandemic. And we need to have progressive teaching practices. Our students are so smart um, and engaging and we need to prepare them for post-secondary life. And, um, and that's, you know, problem solving, critical thinking, advocating for themselves, all of those things. So. Excellent. Oh, I thank you so much for those thoughts. That's excellent. Um, moving on to the next question for the panelists. So at Challenge Success, we talk a lot about expanding the narrow definition of success beyond academic achievement alone. Um, and, and, that, and that pressure sometimes feeds a culture of stress and overload. Um, and we want to improve the stake, the well-being of all stakeholders in our community. Uh, has this experience with the pandemic, including quarantine, remote learning or working, and the changing times in our global community, affected your personal definition of success? And if so, how? I'm going to start with Tess. Yeah, so like I was saying um, earlier, I think that my definition of success has change drastically just because for me um talking about like stress as well stress, I think a good amount of stress is always good personally I like to have a little bit of stress on me at, like all times so that I'm doing my part and I'm really like, working hard but too much stress can like really affect me and I sort of like a breakdown instead of having like positive um so I think for me it just like as long as I'm trying my best and it doesn't even like matter exactly like the grade that I'm getting in the class but as long as I'm like turning in the assignments and I'm giving it my all, that's sort of my definition of success. Like, as long as I'm just like giving it my all, like, for, yeah, pretty much. Awesome, thank you. How about you, Leah? What, what are your thoughts from a teacher perspective? Just how important resiliency is, um, flexibility and, and growth. And um, I think, you know, students that might not have been as interested in school have learned these incredible skills that will make them just better human beings as they grow. I think we all have, but definitely I'm just um, really impressed. And I think it's it's stuff that our kids, you know, when they look back on it and be like, wow, we learned so much, they're gonna just be so much more resilient in their lives in general because they've, they've had to overcome something like this so young. Oh, that's great, thank you. Um, how about you, Jason? The same, you know, I think, um, I think Tess 
you know, said it really well. I mean, there, there is a time where you want to have, you know, an appropriate amount of stress, right? Um, so, but you don't want to be overwhelmed. So I think, and, and to Leah's point, you know, um, we, we really have navigated uh, the pandemic um, to the best of our ability and, and recognize that there's some students, as Tess pointed out, had more stress than others. And so, um, but yeah. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, all right, so, and actually I wanna get maybe Ms. Honeycutt's perspective on this one as well. How, how is your definition of success suggested? You know, I think um, what everyone said, but I think students that are adaptable and resilient, inclusive, empathetic, and intrinsically motivated to learn uh, will be successful no matter what. Um, I've really, we've really been working on um, not doing assignments to get the points, but really wanting to learn concepts and to grow as a human being. And so finding ways to, to teach and get that result. And if you have all those qualities, I, I'm hoping students realize that they will, they will be successful no matter what they do, what, no matter what path they choose um, after high school. So I think there's been a lot of trial and error with uh, the pandemic. And I think students learned a lot and I think they learned that they're resilient, more resilient than they thought. And um, I hope they have confidence moving forward. Um, that, and I hope their, their own definition of success has shifted a little bit. It's not about the grade or where you go to college. It's about who you are as a person and your um, desire to be a lifelong learner. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to the students uh, to, to share with us um, how their perspectives about life after high school may have changed. Just, uh, thinking about college, career, friendships, life in the community, life with family. And we'll start with Cleo. All right, so I'm a student athlete and I play water polo, which means I've dedicated many, many hours to long practices that have taken up weekends, like my whole days. And during COVID, everything shut down, obviously. And I had realized I had no hobbies. I had no idea what I wanted to do in my life. I kind of, I thought I did. I was like, oh, I'll play water polo. I will get into, I'll play college for water polo, but I'm not going to be playing water polo my whole life, I realized, and I had no clue what I wanted to do. So I'm still figuring it out. But for me, um, life after high school changed in my perspective of realizing that I have to figure some things out and that there's more to life than just sports. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. I think a lot of us lived through that. So thank you so much for sharing that. Tess, how about, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so similar to Cleo, I think we all just had a, like, had this sense of, like, realization of just, like, how everything was changing, and I'm obviously not as far along as, like, Cleo and Soren, so I don't have my whole life planned out exactly yet, but I remember pre-COVID, my friends and I used to talk about, like, all the time, like, these ideas we had for what we want, like, what colleges we wanted to go to, what we want, like, what jobs, where we want to live, like, all this planned out and now like after COVID I'm just realizing like like I want to live in the moment like in high school I'm gonna try to just experiment with different things that I like instead of just having one like dense dead set um future and instead just like live in the moment and appreciate all the little things and build that and like really do what like I want to do in life so I think like but as I was saying before just like this realization hit me that like everything's just changing and life throws curveballs at you so you're gonna have to be adapted in your life like no matter what so yeah that was excellent thank you um you could be my personal life coach thank you tess that was amazing um soren what are your thoughts on that one first off i think tess is a lot more prepared than she thinks she is um but so for me i, I was making my uh, college decision obviously during the pandemic and i think the pandemic really showed us the or honestly the power of technology to connect us despite not being anywhere near each other there are times that i had people in class who were on the other side of the world um lucky them but um we, you know it brought it brings us together and I think what that showed me was that no matter where I am you know I can still use technology to get where I'm trying to get um I think that, that definitely influenced my decision because I realized I want to be somewhere though physically where I can just enjoy life and so I ended up choosing Madrid in Spain and I think that was definitely an influence of you know being locked down but also having technology to expand my interests and horizons 
Uh, thank you so much students for sharing those great, great thoughts. I just um, kind of want to riff off of what Cleo said, go, because go I have a water polo player uh, right now. She's a senior. Uh, and then I have a basketball player. He just finished his season, sadly, the other night. But they both looked at me yesterday and they were like, we don't know what to do. <laughs> like the swim season's over. And so um, Rachel was like, I don't, I've been swimming and playing water polo since I was, and I, what do I do? And the same thing with the basketball, he just had this look on his face. Like I've been practicing every day for four years. What do I do? It's, I was like, I, I don't know, go out to lunch, you guys, <laughs> you'll be fine. But it is a real thing, Cleo, when you said that, I'm just like, oh my gosh, they, right now they are at a loss for what to do because practices are over. It's done you know, and this is what they've been doing their whole life. So it's an interesting thing to watch. That's, that's great. Thank you. Thanks for sharing those other stories. Um, Shaheen, what about from the parent perspective? Has, how has this adjusted your thoughts about what success means for, for your yeah, kids? I think quarantine, I don't know that it changed things, but it's sort of hyper-focused, right? So I think parents always say, oh, we just, success for us is our kids to be happy. But what does that really actually mean, right? Because obviously there's going to be adversity in their lives. So really, I look at it from the perspective of like what I saw when my kids flourished was when they felt loved and safe and protected. And that's it. Then I could see them really just go and do their thing, whatever that was. So long as I was just, we were creating a really safe, loving space for them in a really tumultuous time, they could do what they were supposed to do. And so I think that's really what I what I wish is success for them is that they're really rooted um, in feeling that love and, and safety. Um, and then they can just go do do what they need to do. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, well, now we're going to start thinking about, you know, what the times that lay ahead. So as we think about moving forward beyond the pandemic conditions, what can our schools do to help students, staff, and parents readjust to the pandemic? And I think we've talked, we touched on this a little bit, but we're looking really for some specific ideas. So I'll start with the students on this one. So Cleo, what do you, what do you think? I think a very um, important step in this is purposeful, a purposeful outreach from counselors, like an email uh, or just talking to their students in person. I think just saying that, they're here for them and are ready to take up questions. I think that will be uh, make students and parents more comfortable as we ease back into it next year. That's a great suggestion, thank you. Um, Tess, what are your thoughts? So similar to what Cleo said, I think that also just like teachers, I, I've experienced a lot of this this year, which I think even more of it would be amazing next year. Um, but teachers like really caring beyond the grades. So instead of just like giving the worksheets and being there to like teach you how to solve for X, like some of my teachers have also like, like really shaped me into the people who, into the person I am today. Because when you think about it, you're spending like so much time with teachers some kids probably see teachers like more than they see their parents if their parents are working a lot so i think as, like just like leo was saying like a positive outreach from teachers who want to build a relationship beyond the grades and who really care like if you have those missing assignments instead of just telling like failing them having a sit down conversation with them like seeing what the problem is like maybe there's problems going on at home and then like developing ideas with them on how to fix it so that's, yeah, that's what I think. Oh, great, excellent. Going beyond the grades, I love that. Um, Leah, what are your thoughts from a teacher, teacher lens? Well, just kind of like going back to what Shaheen has said, I, I definitely noticed that students coming in, I have a sixth grade group and it was their first time in middle school, even though it was March. And so they were so much younger, like in some ways, and that's just a be aware and embrace the fact that they've learned all these incredible skills other ways, which will help them with their growth incredibly with their technology, with their academics, with the importance of connectedness, but that they're going to be really excited to be um, together and um, just being uh, patient, patient with that, because it might look a little bit different. Um, and I definitely think them uh, just realizing some of them love, you know, being home, there's nice to have both, but in order to be connected to school and just how exciting it is to be there to see other students and just embracing the fact that that things might look a little different than than we're used to being patient. Oh, oh that's excellent. Good themes, good themes. Excellent. And Shaheen, how about your thoughts from a parent lens? Yeah, I think one of the things I've noticed, and maybe this is also my PTA lens, is, is um, how do we re 
recalibrate trust levels between parents and our students and our teachers and our staff and our admin, like, what can we do? And I think, you know, all the, all the things that we do in terms of, you know, here's what the data shows us and those types of communications, that's really interesting, but it's so helpful for us as parents to hear from teachers um, and staff and admin, the more vulnerable human connection and communications, you know, how you think of our kids, like they're your own kids, right? That, that kind of stuff really makes such a difference. It, it helps me feel like you have my most precious thing in the world for eight, 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 six, eight, six hours a day. And I just want to know more about that, that connection. And I think if we do more, um, that would be really helpful. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. And so, and also kind of thinking about it, what schools can do to better um, connect with parents. I, I kind of want to get some various perspectives and I, and, and I actually throw this back to you, Shaheen. You said something about trust, but do you have any other thoughts on, on um, how the schools can go about um, better connecting with parents? So I'll give you the perspective from top of the world. Top of the world, and this is what I know. So top of the world has an, does an incredible job as a community of, of really engaging and activating our parents like on campus. And I know that's a different beast at, at middle school and high school. Like the kids may not even want us on campus, right? Um, so how do we do that? And I think, I think there are ways though, you know, to activate parent community in, in a similar way. I sort of think of it like how we do for sports like how we keep our, our parents kind of activated in our, in our kids' sports lives. You know, you have parent events separate from the kids and things like that. So to keep that kind of spirit of we're all in this together, pandemic or not, right? Um, and I think that makes such a big difference in the lives of our students, right? And as, as what they feel connected to their, to their schools, if our, also our parents feel super connected to our schools, you know, so. I love that, that's great, thank you. How about you, Soren, what are, what are your thoughts? Do you know a great point there? And I think that there's ways to, just, in, in, even with in the classroom, there are some awesome classes. Uh, Authentic exploratory research is one of them, where it's a high school class and you you do your own research project. And I used my my parents, you know, uh, kind of like business network in that project. And I think there's projects like that where we can, you know, capitalize on the resources that we have in this amazing community. And some of that being our parents. Um, I know, like, there's times when, like, my parents will say something, like, "Wait, you do you do that?" And I'll want to learn more about it. And then e increasing those those the opportunity for those moments, or reach out to family. I think in middle school we do a project where I remember inter inter interviewing my grandpa. But I think there's stuff like that where we can, you know, like, look 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 back and use use the you know business networks and you know uh, foster growth and kind of a sense of curiosity um, while using the resources that our amazing community has to offer. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you. Uh, Jason, any thoughts on this one? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we did, we've done some parent education, we've continued to try to, to do that. Um, you know, I, I've appreciated our community liaison and, and the work, you know, we, we've done with uh, some of our even most at risk uh, populations and the work that uh, Irene White's done in special education with our, our parent mentor group. And I think taking off some of the successes we've had from there, uh, from that parent ed side of, of the house to continue to expand that and um, provide opportunities uh, to bring the, the families and parents onto the campus and, and to learn more about what's going on. I know we host things at times and and sometimes it's more like a sit and get where you know they are they're sitting and they're just on the receiving end of a lot of information and, and it can be overwhelming. You know, as Shaheen points out, you know, as you make that transition to, to middle school uh, as a parent, all of a sudden you you go from having you know one teacher that you connect with to you know six, and I think at, there's a fear uh, that attached to that where they don't know how to access the teacher, and and the students start to say, well, mom and dad, I don't need you, I don't want you to interact with my teacher. Um, but I think it's still we need to find those avenues to do that, and I think there's an education component of how to do that, and and the teachers being able to say, you know, I do want to connect with you, I do want to talk to you, um, and and to to Shaheen's point, I mean, uh, the most precious. Uh, part of our lives uh, are at our schools and, you know, uh, myself included, you know, I have both of my students here. And so I, I think we all recognize the importance and value of, of making sure that those connections remain between the adults and the students as they transition forward and that, and that positive communication. And I think, again, that a lot of that can go through, you know, parent education, finding ways, again, to connect um, and those opportunities to connect 
and breaking down those barriers that that just exist sometimes in our head that that actually don't really exist between you know the the uh, parents and math is especially the students age so um, students I know from your perspective um, you know uh, having a 17 year old in my own house who doesn't want me involved as much in, in his you know uh, ongoing grades etc so we have to find that balance right um, and I think you know we've we've talked about you know, um, parents having access to students' grades and sometimes knowing the grade before the student does, you know, they walk in the door. And, and so how do we, again, use parent education to say, look, let the student, you know, explore that and understand, you know, uh, maybe they, maybe let them get their grade before we will have them walk in the door. And I'm, a, I've made the mistake myself. I've been able to see a grade pop up and like, what do you mean you got a zero, you know? So they, and they don't even know that they said, no, no, I turned it in. So I think sometimes we jump um, as parents real quick and you know we want to be able to have those conversations and so um i think as a parent i think it's an important component of what we do and as an educator as well finding that balance in our own lives as parents to not be so overly involved but know when we should be involved and how to have that involvement on behalf of our students so that's excellent thank you so we, uh the laguna beach unified school district has a strategic goal around school culture and it says each student will strengthen connections to the school community and the world by engaging in activities that build skills and responsibility. Some of you have touched on some of the ways that that this, the your schools may help support this, but how can we work as a school community to achieve this relationship oriented goal? And I'll start with Soren. I think this is an, an awesome question. I think it's awesome to connect and what, what we do in practice, you know, the goals and the values that we speak to. And I think a great way to get around to doing this is, you know, like we're doing right here, you know, having conversations, uh, you know, increasing the multi stakeholder conversations we have, um, you know, to see where are we? Um, you know, I think that we, we don't do that enough where we, we, we kind of, we, where like Dr. Lewis said, you know, breaking the boundary um, and these kind of often imaginary boundaries uh, between our, our desires and our wants. Um, I believe that, you know, having these conversations and communication and, you know, just engagement activities uh, can really go a long way um, to students and create an atmosphere uh, where students feel more connected, uh, you know, to their school, their community. Uh, and I think there's also, you know, like I've said this before, you know, expanding the possibilities um, for students to do their own projects, you know, to, and do, take, take their steps without the training wheels on. Um, I think it's an, another great way to expand connection to the world. Excellent. Uh, Don, what are your thoughts on this one? Mute. Yes, um, I think Zoom really taught me that, and I, I've always known this, but Zoom did teach me that we can expand outside of the bubble of Laguna Beach, um, that we can bring in people from, from we, can, we can share stories with uh, classrooms from across the country. Um, we, you know, I had Phil and Sarah Kay come and they're spoken word poets and they did a workshop for a week and we did that virtually and it was so cool for the kids. I know Mr. Sogo, uh, during the pandemic had former students that are working on their PhDs come in and talk about their PhD work to his students. And those were so well attended by the students. So we can have these, we can sort of go outside of the boundaries of Laguna Beach and we can reach out and get these people um, to come in and talk about their experiences. And I think it's just, it's so vibrant and wonderful for the students to, to get to see these other people um, in fields that they protect, they, they may like or are or, or interested in. I had Jim Lindbergh from Pennywise, he's a punk rocker, come and talk about being an English major at UCLA and how important it is to read. <laughs> um, and you know, so we can go out there and, and meet new people from different areas. And I think that really is engaging for the students. I know that the week that they didn't see me and they saw Phil and Sarah Kay, they were like, this was the best week of the pandemic. I'm like, thanks a lot guys. But it, you know, it really was, they really enjoyed it. And so I just think we need to pop the bubble and, and technology now we know we can do it. And like, like Soren said, just, you know, communicate and just make these connections. I know they do it with MUN, they make connections with kids from all across the world and it's it's very cool. Yeah, that's fantastic. Making those real, real world connections, it's fantastic. All right, so, um, it, you know, all of our schools really focus on rigorous opportunities for students. Um, what are your thoughts about how we can balance a focus on rigorous opportunities for all and student well-being? I'm curious about Cleo's perspective on this one. So one thing I really like about LBHS is that 
um, they don't deny their students um, ed, like wanting to further their education, whether it's taking honors classes, AP classes. I feel like it may not really matter where you are. You can take that class. And I think having the teachers listen to their students of what how they want to challenge themselves and how they're going to take on what they want to do is something important that we can that will help change the student well-being. OK, excellent. How about you? What are your thoughts, Leah? Well, I think we have a great, a pretty strong academic rigorous program, which is why it's mm -hmm. so important to have for a child and then connect to this and going back with the social opportunities and everything and kind of like um, we have also so much access. We have an amazing counseling and support staff here. And so they also come into the classrooms. They introduce themselves. I think our students are very aware of who they are um, and just continuing with that aspect of relationships as long as well as you know the teachers um, connecting with their students as well. Any thoughts on this one, Jason? You know, I think it, it's kind of been said, you know, um, so Leah probably said it the best in, in all honesty. So not to be repetitive. I don't want to say yeah. the same thing over and over yeah. again. So <laughs> so, um, so social emotional supports are, are something that we do, uh, we have offered and provide for students in terms of prevention and intervention across all of our school sites. Um, I'm just curious about what is your awareness of social emotional supports on campus? And in what ways might you recommend improving social emotional supports uh, provided in the school setting? Cleo already had mentioned a proactive reach out from counselors uh, just as a check-in and counselors work across with uh, the spectrum with academic support and social emotional supports. So that's a great suggestion. Any thoughts, Tess, on this one? Yeah, so I think just also making um, counselors less stigmatized is really important because I like I know some of my friends and I like really love the counselors and I've definitely gone to them for problems before and it's just a great um, like person to have to go and talk to about your problems. But I know that a lot of teenagers, especially because we're moody and like just everything don't like asking for help. So I think that if counselors are less stigmatized and more normalized and maybe like having like um, other students like and student representatives showing that like it's normal to see a counselor and they're like here for you. I think just making them more normalized so then other kids are not afraid to go to them and they can talk to them like that would help a lot with mental health too because kids like even if they're just having a stress today where they have a lot to do like they can go talk to a counselor and just like have a little mindful moment where they can just like regroup on everything. So I think that's really important. Fantastic. Um, Shaheen, what is the parent perspective on ways that the that the schools can increase student social emotional strengths and, and reduce distress? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, from my perspective, it's it's giving the kids agency. I think that really helps them feel, I mean, the pandemic really took a lot of that away from them, right? Parents were making all kinds of decisions for our children. Um, and I think any opportunity I had as a parent to, to have to let them be able to make a choice. I just said, do what, do, yes, do what you need to do. Um, and I think that really helps the kids feel like they have some say in how their life's going. So I think that brings them that stress level down. And I think the other part of it, I'll say as, um, you know, sort of giving them space to develop, giving them space to change their minds. I think the kids have all talked about that, like wanting that ability to test that right to be present to what they kind of feel in the moment um, I think as parents sometimes we have all these expectations right they were born and we already figured out what their lives were going to be right so to kind of rein all of that in and 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 give them some time to to, to decide what they want for themselves I think that that really also helps and Shaheen I can't help but riff off of that it, that maps perfectly over to a teacher in that providing choice for my students, choice, 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 gave them agency in their learning. And when they choose something to do, to read, to write about, they are 100% more engaged uh, than when I assign it. So I have to give up what my plan for them is. I mean, I, I obviously have a plan, but the more that I provide choice and the more that I say, well, what's interesting to you in the novel? What do you want to write about? They're all in. And it's really hard to let go of control, but the more that I do that, the more engaged my students are. I just had to jump in because it maps no, perfectly. It perfect. And Don, perfect. I saw that too with, with my daughter and a teacher who said, just pick a book 
and you can write on, she was a fifth grader, right? And I saw her just blossom because in her critical thinking, because she was really into that book. So yes, hundred percent. Thank you. These are great. So we got some big transitions actually for two of our, well, actually everybody, uh, all of our students on this, on this, uh, uh, panel today. Um, we're transitioning into summer now, but some uh, we have Soren uh, graduating and we have Tess matriculated to the high school. Clear, going to be a uh, junior next year, so that's a big transition. Um, so when thinking about transitions such as middle school to high school or high school graduation uh, and life after high school, what are you most excited about and what do you have apprehension about? And, and also think about like what would you want your teachers or the adults in your lives, uh, lives to know about? And we'll start with Cleo. So more broadly, I'm excited to go on and live life out of the Orange County bubble. Next year as a junior, I am mostly excited about taking the further step um, in my academic in my academics, because obviously junior year is a big important year for colleges. And I am it's my first time taking AP classes and I'm excited for that, but I am also apprehensive of what I'm going to do with my life. I've talked about that, and I just feel like teachers and administrators, administrators should know that the COVID year has really pushed us all back, and that next year we may need to ease into the year a little bit more. <laughs> That's a great thought. Thank you. Um, Soren, what are your thoughts on your big transition? Yes, yeah, so I have a big, big transition coming. And I think I'm most excited for the, the new frontier. And I've always been through, through high school, you know, we've had, I believe, a new schedule every single year. And, you know, it, it does make it exciting. Um, there's always something new coming. And I like it. It keeps you on my toes, which is always fun. Um, and I think the one thing, and Clue mentioned this, is that I think one thing I'm apprehensive about is that because we're in such a bubble, I think that no matter how much I read, and, and I read quite a bit, or how much, you know, I watch about stuff, um, I can never really know more than like, and I, I can, it's hard to have the experience outside the bubble. And I think that that's one thing. I'm not sure how we would do this, but I wish that there was more opportunities to get outside this bubble, you know, get, get like really into the world, um, beyond Laguna beach, beyond, beyond like our, on the coast of Southern California. Um, I think what I want uh, my teachers and administrators and adults to know is that I'm so grateful for the opportunities, um, that have been given me to take agency. Uh, I mentioned AR already, and that's an amazing class with the whole class, you know, taking agency, take guiding yourself. But there are so many opportunities, like Mrs. Honeycutt said, um, when, you know, she gave us the opportunity to choose an essay to write about. And even, and it's the small stuff too that matters. So I'm just grateful for that. Um, and I think that from that, I've been able to find my passions and find who I am. Oh, thank you so much, Soren. Tess, what are your thoughts on, on your transition to high school? So I'm definitely excited for the independence in high school, because I feel like just like as we transition through all the schools like the jump from even like elementary school to middle school there's just so much more independence and I love that and I know a lot of people like my friends and peers really enjoyed like that more independence um, and like you guys said like taking agency in our own work so I'm really excited that in the next like four years I'll be able to choose my classes and all of that um, but something that I want the teachers to be aware of is this, um, I'm nervous for high school, like as it is, and there are kids who haven't been on a physical campus for like a year and a half. So for them to just be going from like, oh yeah, seventh graders, we're in the middle of middle school, like blah, 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 to just jumping into high school without even talking to people for a year and a half, or maybe even seeing people in real person, like that's like scary to me. And I'm like, like I said, I'm already nervous as it is. So I think as like to just be as welcoming as possible and making sure that every student feels like welcome and safe when they come back. I think that's gonna be one of the most important things. And like Cleo said, just like easing into it because there are gonna be kids who are like really scared of high school. And then like setbacks in education and just social emotional health, like et cetera, so yeah. And I am just going to jump in and say um, to the three students, you are not behind. I feel really strongly about this. I'm going to get on my soapbox. You are not behind anything. You are right where you need to be. You have so many more arrows in your quiver than years past. Um, being online, learning how to do Canvas. It's incredible the skills that you have learned during this pandemic. So no teacher is like, oh my gosh, we got to catch them up. 
Mm -mm. The whole world has been through a pandemic. You are where you are, and we're going to meet you right where you are. So don't go to the next level thinking I'm behind. I'm nervous about that. You've had enough to worry about. Don't worry about that. Please don't worry about that. I really feel strongly about this. You are not behind. You are not behind anyone. No, you are not. You are right where you need to be. And we are grateful and lucky to have you on our campus next year. I feel strongly, sorry. Thank you, Don. <laughs> that was very emphatic and I appreciate that very much. It was awesome. Um, Shaheen, any thoughts from a parent perspective about transitions? And how yes, I've got a fifth choosing? grader transitioning yeah. to Thurston. And so on the one hand, I'm so excited for her, right? Because unfortunately, you know, she actually gets to go back on campus next year, which is which is incredible. And those kids that had that kind of weirdness where they couldn't go back, but they transitioned to a new school. So, so I'm excited for her. I think I'm a little apprehensive. And I guess the, the, the ask I would have of, of teachers and staff, you know, is just to pay attention to all the subtle things. I know you're all thinking about this and I'm just gonna say it again, but just to pay attention to the subtle things that the kids may not be able to articulate um, how they're feeling or, or what you might be noticing and kind of get to know these kids kind of where they're at um, and look out for the little, little things that, you know, that any parent would be looking out for um, just because they've been through so much the last 12, 12 months. Thank you. That's excellent. Um, I, I want to drill into one topic before we get wrapping up in about 10 minutes or so. Um, so we'll, we'll do this topic and then, and then get some gets close to our conclusion. Um, so we give stu students feedback in a lot of different ways. And Dr. Valori mentioned this a little bit in one of his comments. Um, and that letter grades and feedback in real time is something that's pretty new for our students that are in school right now. It's whether that's through Google Classroom at the elementary level or Canvas in sixth or 12th grade. I'm just curious from the student perspective, what are your thoughts about your parents having constant access to your grades or assignments, uh, assignment completion? And maybe from the teacher perspective, what are your thoughts about constant parental access to student grades? And then maybe Shaheen, you might wanna weigh in on, on what, what your thoughts are about real-time access to student, student performance. So we'll start with Cleo. So having my parents have constant access to my grades, it kind of adds a extra stress. I'm sure a lot of students and parents can agree that we, as a student, I've walked through my house and my mom has said, why do you have a zero or why do you not have this completed when I may have a well thought out answer on why or that maybe the teacher hasn't graded it yet. But I think that parents sometimes really just jump to the conclusion and then add that stress that is not needed. And I think as a student, just, I think there's certain situations where parents do need to be involved in their students' grades, but I think the constant access pushes it a little too much. All right, thank you, Cleo. Soren, any thoughts on this one? Yeah, and I think uh, Mrs. Hanika and she didn't spoke to us, you know, it's like, I think giving up this, this kind of, this, this control for like future rewards, I don't think I'd be where I am today um, if it wasn't for my mom not being pretty hands off and kind of making it so that, you know, I stumble and I have to, I'd have to get myself back up. So I think there's something to be said for kind of, you know, taking away some of the, the parent, you know, control and access. Um, I think the constant access and, and I see my mom with the constant access with my younger siblings being much more kind of like helicoptering, as they say. Um, and, and I think that it's empowering, you know, parents in terms of that control um, so that students feel empowered. Um, in the long term, I think is, is definitely, there's definitely a balance to be had there. Okay, great thought. How about you, Tess? So I know just from like myself, my experience and my experiences with my friends, like I've heard my friends where we'll get a test handed back and they're like, say they didn't do too well on the test. Like instead of being concerned on how they're going to like go talk to the teacher, see what they can do to make it up, they're more worried about their parents' reaction. Like I remember coming out of a test and um, my friends, um, like I, if I like miss a test, that, sorry, um, if I do bad on a test, I'm usually going up to the teacher and talking to the teacher and figuring out what I can do. Like if there's quiz corrections or mo more focusing on like what knowledge that I missed on that test, like what I'm gonna miss. Whereas some of my friends will just like be like, oh my gosh, like my dad's gonna be so mad. Well, like uh, that's just an example. So I think it's all about a healthy balance because yes, it is good to have a little bit of pressure being put on you and for teachers to be able to see some of it. But I think that constant access can be really negative so yeah that's great thank you uh let's hear from some teachers so leah what are your what are your thoughts well 
as a parent <laughs> um, of my fourth grader, I try really hard not to helicopter, um, but I probably do. Like if he misses two points on a social studies test, we have to review both of those questions. Um, I've noticed when I've tried to get a little bit more hands off or give it a little bit more space or review less frequently, he actually tends to definitely understand it as a parent. Um, I think middle school, it kind of needs to be a balance. Personally, I really think there still needs to be a level of parent involvement um, to be sure that students are keeping on, on track. It's kind of like training wheels for the high school. So they need to start learning how to be more self-advocates. Um, some of them really do need to have some more support all the way around between teachers and parents um, with the access to the grades to some extent. Um, until they can really learn to, to be more self-sufficient um, and check their grades and be um, intrinsically motivated, uh, not just to explain it to their parents. But um, I think it needs to be kind of a balance. Um, I think we're really, really fortunate here to have a very involved parent community that is very interested in their, their students' grades. Um, and, I, and again, I, I get that as a parent. And so I think it, it at the middle school level, it needs to be balanced. I'd say, you know, it's trying to take the wheels off by eighth grade, but I definitely think sixth graders and seventh graders need a little bit of support, you know, to have parents that can see it. That's just, that's my thought. Uh, yeah, I love that middle school perspective. It's excellent. And it, it, as a pre-high school preparation, Don, what are your thoughts about high school? Yeah, I think what the, the students said, um, let them be in control of their grades. Uh, they are they are in control of their grades and they they know, uh, what they're missing and what they've discussed with the teacher. We try to get kids to advocate for themselves first. Um, you know, as a teacher, I always love to hear from a student first. Um, and I know, you know, ninth graders, we have to sort of ease them into that, but um, we want them to be confident and successful post-secondary. And if they move on to a college, they need to be able to access those supports uh, on their own because I have, a, I have two kids, they're 28 and 26. Um, and I've tried to call the college um, and ask about grades and they don't talk to you. Once they're 18, you can't get any information. Um, so don't do that. I tended to be a kind of a lawnmower parent. I was not a helicopter, but I was a lawnmower. I was gonna like pave the way so that it was smooth for my son, my firstborn. And don't, you know, if they forgot their Jersey, uh, let them, you know, practice without their Jersey. Um, these are small, small lessons that are hard. Like I, I would drive that Jersey 30, 30 minutes so that they had the correct gear for their practice. And um, I really wish if I could go back because it took my son seven years to graduate from college um, that I would have not maybe paved no such as, I know that's a lot of money. You guys, it's so much money and high school's free. So don't like, don't let them like stumble because it's free, it's free. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Sorry. Amazing. <laughs> any, any, any thoughts, uh, Shaheen? I, uh, you may, you're not as familiar with Canvas yet, but any thoughts on? Well, on we had, yeah, so we, yeah, so we transitioned, right, because of VA to this Google Classroom. And, you know, my kids were sort of thrown into kid college, right? They had like Zoom calls and schedules and assignments, and it, it was a little bit nutty. So, um, and it just was, it was, I mean, it wasn't anyone's fault. It just what it was, what it was. So I definitely, I loved getting that little Google classroom summary for the day because I could just check in and say, Hey, this says it's missing. Did you turn it in? And you know, half the time my son would be like, Oh, I forgot to check the turn in box or whatever. Right. So it was just helpful. Um, but as far as the grades, I hear what all these students are saying. I, I mean, I, the way I was raised, my parents really were not involved in like, they just trusted that the teachers were doing what they were supposed to be doing. Unless the teacher told them, hey, we have an issue. They just kind of figured everything was trucking along. I sort of do the same. I mean, I I want, you know, if, I, if the teachers come to me and say, hey, we've got an issue, I'm really on it, um, maybe, to, maybe to an extreme. But until I hear that, I'm sort of trusting that things are kind of going along as they should. I mean, I I want my teachers, my kids' teachers to have the space to do what they need to do. And I want my students, my, my kids to have the space to figure out how to navigate all of that, right? So me, like, it's not my instinct. My instinct is to do this, but I try my best to stay back as much as possible, so. Thank you and so isn't much. a isn't a better question to ask the students when they come home, like, what did you learn today? Mm. You know, instead of what grade did you get on that test? I mean, test, wouldn't you like that if you're if a parent said, what did you learn today? Or did you did you meet someone new? I mean, I, it yeah. sounds cheesy, but if I can just jump in here really quick, because I think that's really important. Like, that's why I think I love the way that like my parents have done like parenting for that sort of thing, because like 
of like every day usually when I get home from school or like elementary school and now like my mom's always like oh like what you learn in English like my dad's like oh yeah how was like your day in school and instead like if I get home from a test and my mom like and I my mom sees a bad grade or something see this is where it comes a balance comes in she's like okay let's go over like what you missed or like did you talk with your teacher about what you can do in the future instead of just like oh my god you got such a bad grade like she focuses on like that knowledge that I missed just like that I was saying Oh, this is great. Excellent. Thank you. I'm learning stuff. Thank you. That's very helpful. Me too. Awesome. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> One thing uh, I'd point out, Dr. Keller, I yeah. think it's important. You know, our students um, overwhelmingly want to do well in school. I mean, they tell us that, uh, you know, when we, that's a survey question that we give every year. And, you know, 95, 96% of our students, so I would say all, uh, when you look at a percentage that high, are saying, you know, I want to do well in school. Um, that uh, they care about school, that they put, they are motivated, you know, to, to do their best work. Uh, so one, that, I think that's a testament to our community, our parents, our um, uh, guardians, our teachers, who are trying to pull that out of the, of the students and, and keep them motivated. And I think uh, hearing, uh, you know, Soren talk a little bit about choice and opportunities to, you know, really connect with the learning um, is really important. And to this point, you know, um, when you aren't successful on a test and you, the, the question is more about, you know, why'd you get an, a, a bad grade? It, it switching it around to what she was saying, which is, you know, what, what learning did you, did you not have? Like, what, what were you missing? You know, um, and did you make a, a minor mistake? Cause it might not even be that you don't have the information. It simply might've been, you know, that you didn't read the question very well. Um, I find that to be the case with um, one of my kids um, is that, uh, you know, every so often they have a tendency to rush through uh, test questions and, and make silly mistakes. And so it's not so much about knowledge. It's more around the fact that they're just not taking, you know, slowing down and taking the time. So, you know, I, I really want, I'm super proud of our students. Uh, you know, they, they really want to work so hard, um, not only for themselves and for their families, but for the community. I mean, as a whole, you talk about the students from Laguna Beach, you know, there was a, a recent ranking that came out around just, you know, how, how we are perceived in, in the United States as a high school or one of the top ranked simply because our students are out there doing things. Graduates, you see their name, they're being, you know, things being posted on the internet. That's how they queried this out. And that just shows you how much our students are going out into the broader space and do well beyond, you know, uh, high school and, and beyond our, our work here. So, um, I, I'm just so appreciative of, of one, our students on this panel, because I know that, you know, they, they really do kind of represent all the students that we have in this district, because they all said the same things that we're seeing on these survey results year in and year out. So again, it's a great place. I know it is. And that's, that's my goal is to continue to make it a great place for students, staff and, and our community. Um, you know, we, we, we have work to do. We always do. And, you know, we have some rebuilding to do, uh, you know, COVID was, was a tough, tough, thing for us to manage and, and we're not alone. I think that's the other point that I'd make is that we, we can't, we have to recognize that COVID was not just in Laguna Beach. COVID impacted everybody. So when we think about impacts, um, it, it's, it's, it extends far beyond just, just us. I mean, our neighboring school districts are, are, were impacted, but every state was impacted. So every student, uh, you know, Soren, every graduate from high school this year was deeply impacted by COVID. And you know, you're all walking into whatever your post-secondary career might look like, um, whether it be going into college or going trade or going into work, whatever it might be, um, everyone is, is uh, going to be navigating you know, the challenges that, uh, that COVID brought on. And, and it's gonna take a little time, I think, for us all to rebound. Um, but I would say the key is not to go back to quote unquote normal, but to determine like, what are those things that we wanna to continue to do as we've talked about on this, uh, you know, this um, webinar is there are things that we should continue to do that we've learned through this process that we, pro we probably would not have learned and, and uncovered throughout. So again, just appreciate, um, you know, the idea that our students are, you know, hyper-focused on doing well. And, uh, but to the point, let's not, not make it about grades, let's make it about learning. And so I appreciate, you know, the, the commentary around that. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moria. <clears throat> We're getting really close to our end time. So I wanna do a last whip around um, and wanted to really think about um, in a phrase or a sentence, what is an appreciation or gratitude or positive reflection that you'd like to offer the people in your life or potentially a silver lining? 
And we'll start with Tess. So I think really just something important that I like learned just over these past uh, this past year is appreciate the little things because you never know when they're going to be gone in an instant. Like, for example, I was lucky enough to, I got, I had a sleepover with some of my best friends literally the day before everything shut down. So we're like, we were having like the best times of our life. And then the next day we're like, oh my God, like I can't see you for like two months. And meanwhile, then in like mid-May, we're sending photos from that night. Like, oh my gosh, I miss when times were normal, like blah, blah, blah. So I think it's just appreciate the little things and even just like the small signs that show um, that things are starting to get better. Like, for example, like Thurston opening all the bathroom stalls instead of like certain ones. It's just the little things that show that like times are just going to go back to normal, whatever this new normal is. I, I just want you to know I, I made that decision. So I, I want the credit. <laughs> it was a tough one. We had to run that through a panel of experts. Um, all right, Clea, what are your thoughts? So I think over the course of this year, I grew a even bigger appreciation for LBHS and our staff and teachers because I feel like we've been focusing the spotlight on students, but the teachers and staff have been going through the same thing that we have and that the teachers pushing for us to get to further our education with the Zoom and really trying to like on Zoom, I, I learned so much on Zoom more than I, people think than in classroom in classrooms and i think we really have to pre i'm appreciative of my teachers for wanting that for us and pushing for us to be in person now and teaching so thank you cleo all right so on what are your thoughts you know, i'm grateful for despite all the chaos that we've had this past year that it has brought us together i think you know all of us here are together on a zoom webinar which would you know be unheard, unheard of before and not only that, but you know, it's really, it kind of, as COVID says, is simplified and it made us focus on what we really care about. And I hope that we can take that forward and tend these shared collective um, goals um, and intent that we want to create uh, in our lives, in our community. Excellent. Thank you. How, Shaheen, how about, what are your thoughts? I mean, we made it through, right? And so I think there's a lot of just reveling in that um, and, and noticing just how much our community connected and and got each other through this. And sure, there were tons of bumps as no one could have predicted how to navigate this exactly perfectly. Um, but I think that's that would be the thing I would say is just to remember that we did actually make it through one of the most difficult things hopefully we'll ever have to experience, right? We got through our toughest days and um, and to just remember the simple things and, 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 the, and to look out for each other, really. Excellent, thank you, good reflection. Uh, Don, how about you? I am just so grateful for how lovely my students were during a very difficult year as I was navigating new technology. They were so kind and patient and sweet. You know, Ms. Honeycutt, you're muted. Ms. Honeycutt, we can't see the screen. Um, and they were just so lovely and patient and they knew that I cared and I was trying my best. And um, you really do, parents, you really do have wonderful, lovely children. They are, they were just, I mean, I, there were days where I was just in tears, which it doesn't take long for me to get to tears, but um, where I was just so like thankful that the students were so patient, very patient. And the other thing that I'm grateful for is classroom noise. When we went back to full time and I put that first question out and I said, talk to, you know, talk to the person sitting next to you. And I heard that collective classroom noise. Uh, I did cry. It was amazing. It was amazing. I missed it. Thank you. That's incredible. Uh, Leah, how about you? Um, I think one of the silver linings is definitely our technology component. I, I, I just have to kind of back up whatever we've been saying. And I just think we have so many great things we could bring into modern learning that we can keep like this, the Zoom and the webinar is just amazing. And I feel like I just got way better as a teacher being able to actually navigate all that with the help of a lot of my students <laughs> telling me how to do stuff because they just somehow magically know how to do these things. Um, but the other thing is, is just appreciating your people. I think my biggest thing was like, wow, I'm like, I've always liked what I you know, do, but I'm like, no, I really like it. Like, I feel so fortunate that, that we're here. I think Laguna Beach is a very special place. I think the kids are just un unreal. Staff is incredible. And I was just, I, it just really made me appreciate like, the people, all the people that we have are just incredible here. Excellent. Thank you. And Dr. Valoria, wrap it up. You know, I think um, 
to the point that uh, Leah just made around technology, and I think um, others have said it as well. You know, we started off um, this last, well, I'll say March of last year when this all really started. Um, I can give you the exact date if you want, but um, you know, I think we all recognize it, it was a significant shift. And when you think about all of the things that we had in place, you know, I'm. You have to reflect back. I mean, the school board. Um, was has been working so diligently to improve our technology. We have an amazing uh, technology department. And so where other districts were struggling to get devices in students' hands, we our students had those devices. Where you know they were struggling getting students' connectivity, we were able to work in and provide those um, opportunities. And so you know when we looked at uh, how are we going to do things over the summer, to ensure that you know we're able to assess students for special education and do the things that we weren't able to do in the in the late spring of last year we shut down staff came up with ideas you know and we were, we were building plexiglass walls i mean we were doing everything we could do to try to find a way to, to navigate this and it was an all hands on deck approach i mean every single person students parents everybody was was really trying their hardest to try to make this uh, you know experience um, which we all recognize, you know, in this pandemic, it's a pandemic. It's not a, it's, you know, it's not a positive thing. Uh, but the, how do you take away those, those positive pieces that we've learned throughout that time, and and recognizing that, um, you know, we can continue to do better even throughout the pandemic. We recognize, hey, we need to change this. We need to shift that. And so, you know, as a nimble, us being small, we're a pretty nimble organization. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the staff, the students, uh, the community to continue to be nimble and, and make sure that we're doing what's best on behalf of our students. I heard a lot today about making those continuing to make those connections, staff and students. And, you know, I recognize at the high school, middle school level, it's not as easy that, at the you know, K-5 level where they have a smaller number of students that they're, they're having to work with. You get to see, you know, uh, five classes sometimes of, of 20 plus students. Um, and sometimes, you know, in previous 30 plus students uh, over the course of the day, having the, that time to make those personal connections gets harder and harder as, uh, as our students age up. So it is a, a challenge. And oftentimes I think our, um, our students um, are trying to find ways to self advocate, um, but it can be difficult when they see five or six different teachers and five or six different approaches. And, you know, that is where we want to continue to you know, reach out and make sure that our students have a connection to somebody on campus. Research is very clear that students are far successful when they know that there's a person, an adult on that campus that cares about them. And that doesn't mean they care about their grades. It doesn't mean they're, you know, necessarily uh, giving them uh, pointers on how to write um, uh, essays, but it's around, they know something personal about me. They know what I'm trying to accomplish in life. They know what's going on in, in the personal issues that I might be um, navigating. And that's what we want to make sure we're getting to because that personal connection will instill hope in students far longer than, than you know, a, a grade on an essay, right? I mean, uh, Gallup did a, does amazing research on, you know, how we can instill hope in students and how long that, um, you know, continues to keep that student moving forward. And that has to be done through a personal connection. It cannot be done, you know, through just handing back a grade of an A on an essay, giving feedback that way. That, that's not how it happens. And so I, I think, you know, we can continue to grow um, uh, to connect with our students. And we've been, that's been a focus of ours. You know, relationships matter, we know that. Um, and so I appreciate our students telling us how it's best, how they best connect with us as adults. You know, it's not easy. Raising teenagers um, is not easy. And so, you know, you guys have to be able to communicate what works for you too. And, um, and if you're not finding that connection on campus, you know, finding a way to advocate for yourself too and say, look, this is what I think we need. Uh, you know, one of the things I noticed in one of the more recent survey results was that students just felt like we didn't have the time to make some of those personal connections. And, and that's, that's a challenge for us, obviously, in our schedule is how do you find that time that they can establish a connection outside of the classroom time, whatever it might be. Um, uh, our students have a tendency to be very involved in sports. So a lot of times they find that time in, in, in that way. But how for those that are not, how, do we, how are we reaching those students that are not, maybe not involved in an extracurricular activity to make sure that they have somebody too. So again, we will continue to work hard on behalf of our students. Appreciate staff and Dr. Keller for putting this on. Uh, I think it's just a great opportunity for us to you know, learn, continue to learn.
And thank you, Jason. Thank you, panelists. Um, I, I do also, yeah, I want to personally thank you all for participating today. All of your voices are so important for this conversation. I want to thank our partners at PTA Coffee Talk also, who helped us to, you know, market this event, and and um, and then of course the continuous support of School Power as well. So um, we do have a few brief minutes to open it up um, for, to our Q and A. If there's any any part. Um, uh, audience member questions for our panelists. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Shelley Spassard. Thank you so much. It has been so awesome to be present and hearing from each of you. So powerful. Um, if you are a, one of our attendees and you have a question for our panel, please go ahead and put your question in the Q&A. We have a couple minutes here. If there are any questions uh, that you'd like us to answer, pertaining to the relationships and where we have been and where we are going um, throughout this year and beyond. So we'll give just a couple minutes for that to see if we have any questions coming in. I don't see any standing by here. Well, I think um, as we kind of wrap it up, I will turn it back over to uh, Dr. Keller and Soren, yeah. um, just so privileged to be here and part of the process. And I think one of the most amazing pieces is just hearing from students. Um, we just can't hear from them enough and they are why we are here and why we do what we do. So thank you for mm -hmm. having me today. And Soren, I'll leave, I'll leave it up to you. you this is, I uh, really wanna emphasize that this really was Soren's, uh, Soren's swan song as he's as he's wrapping up his his career here in Laguna Beach so I appreciate you getting all of us together we would like to do this on a on an annual basis and so that's no that's swan's legacy <laughs> thank you Dr. Keller so, and this is a team effort and I hope that we can continue these conversations on even you know in person if possible um, I think you know these conversations are so powerful for creating those relationships that Dr. Laura was speaking to um, and I think the more we talk the more we listen the more we grow, the more we learn. And I think we just, that's what we need to do in, in our lives, in our school, in our jobs. Um, I really hope we can, we can continue that onwards um, when, I, when I'm sadly gone from, from the school and the district. Oh, thank you. It's called Impact. Nice job. All right, everybody. I hope you have all, all have a wonderful, uh, wonderful Thursday and a great last week of school. And be safe. Look forward to talking to you in person soon. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.